Hello, and welcome to the virtual worship service for Ada Congregational Church. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, we pray that you would find welcome here among a group of people who are doing our best to love all and welcome all and seek justice for all. We certainly invite you into that journey with us. As we begin today in this season of Lent, a couple of announcements. One, we found out that a couple of people who are eligible, they're in an eligible age group uh, to get the vaccine, had not yet been able to register for a variety of reasons. And it can be complicated and that's okay. But we wanna help with that. So if you're somebody who has not yet registered for a vaccine and you'd like to get one, contact the church office or Pastor Rebecca or myself, and we'll connect you with a couple of people from our church who have committed to helping others uh, get connected in that way. Let us know. Another one is Easter baskets are going out. Uh, We have over 90 of them now, and that's an enormous undertaking. And part of that involves uh, sponsorships. They're $10 a basket. We invite you to sponsor one of those, and you can do that through the church website or check out your midweek newsletter uh, for more links to that. There's also a sign-up genius where you can sign up for baked goods. Uh, We'd love to include cards from the congregation. Um, People are delivering those. There's 90. That's a lot of deliveries. So there's various ways that you can be connected, and we'd love for everyone to be involved as we try to reach out and love our congregation well with these Easter baskets. So a couple of ways that you can connect. And now as we move toward worship, I'd love to take a moment and reflect. It was one year ago this weekend when our church leadership met after school had been canceled and said, what do we do? Do we cancel church? You can't cancel church, but school was canceled and and the pandemic was looming and growing. And there was a lot of fear and anxiety and we weren't sure what to do. And we had never done this. We had never gone live, but we did it. And those first couple were just live in my living room, fireside chats. But I hope it reminded us that we were all in this together and that God is with us. And we've certainly picked up our technology a little bit better over the past 12 months. But here we are 12 months later, and a lot has happened. Um, We've lost family and friends and loved ones, congregation members even. And it's hard. And there's been a lot in all of our lives. And so we want to pause in this season of Lent where we are focused on the theme, God is at work. We want to pause. We want to focus and not dwell on it, but but to have a sense of this is, this is a big deal. This has been a big deal. And so as we light our Christ candle, as we light our Christ candle, we remember Will you pray with me? God, our merciful maker, you love the world that you made and you want us to be whole and healthy. Yet the world you made is suffering. The world you made is struggling. Visit us with your mercy and make us whole. God, our loving friend, the seasons keep changing, but we remain separated from our friends and from our neighbors and our church family. It's been a long year. We miss the comfort of warm hugs, of shared meals, friendly visits. But you sent us a comforter, the Holy Spirit. Wrap us in that comforter today. Wonder worker, in this year when everything changed, when we have felt worried and weary, when we wailed and we wondered, you gave us a promise that nothing can separate us from your love and nothing will be wasted with you at work. Light, life, love, and liberation always win. Amen. We light this Christ candle to remind us that Christ is the light of the world. Let's worship together. Oh!
so greatly pardoned, I'll forgive another. The law of love I gladly will obey. Your kingdom come around and through and in me. Your power and glory let them shine through me. Your hallowed name, oh may I bear with honor, and may your living kingdom come in me. The bread of life, oh may I share with honor, and may Welcome, friends. Today, we move our arrow to the fourth Sunday in Lent. And in this season, we are thinking of how God is at work, and we are adding crosses to our cross tree. The first was the trefoil cross, and then the cross crosslet, and last week, the passion cross. Today, we add this symbol that may not even look like a cross to you. It is called the Tau cross, T-A-U. And this is the Hebrew word for the letter T. And people have put it in connection to the story in the Old Testament that Pastor Rick will share today. The story is that Moses was leading the people through the wilderness. And, and there, as they were questioning and grumbling, God gave Moses a message to take a snake, wrap it around a pole, and lift it high for all the people to see. And those who would lift their eyes to see the sacrifice of this snake would be saved. And so we think of this shape of a cross as one that possibly a snake could be wrapped around and lifted high as a pole. This story was one that Jesus himself taught to the people later on. And now as followers of Jesus, we see the connection between that story and the story of our own Jesus being sacrificed upon the cross at Easter. It's quite a powerful story of how God would give his son to fill our hearts with love and to wash away our sin. And what a challenge it is for us as followers to open our eyes to see Jesus in that sacrifice and to be saved. Even today, as I hold this cross and I think of a friend who made it for me many years ago at another church, I'm reminded of how many faithful followers there are of Jesus. That all of us together around the world are working together to open our eyes, to see God's work, to see the love of Jesus, and to see where we can be part of that plan. So today, we add the Tau Cross. And if you are doing this at home, you can add your version of this cross. Let us say our prayer together. Dear God, thank you for your love. Open our eyes to see. Help us to see Jesus. Amen. I say a special blessing to our friends, Miley, George, and Grace. God made you, God loves you, and God cares for you. I walk today where Jesus walked. 
in days of long ago. I wandered down each path he knew with reverent step and slow. Those little lanes they had not changed. A sweet peace fills the air. I walk today where Jesus walked and felt his presence. pathway led through Bethlehem, our memories ever sweet. The little hills of Galilee that knew those childish feet. The Mount of Olives Jesus knew before I saw the mighty Jordan roll as in the days of yore. I knelt today where Jesus knelt, where all alone he prayed. The garden of Gethsemane, my heart felt unafraid. I burdens up and with him by my side I climbed the hill of Calvary I climbed to the hill of Calvary I climbed to the hill of Calvary where on the Jesus walked and felt him close to me. Our scripture lesson this morning includes the most famous verse in the Bible. If you've watched sports, you see it on signs, you see it on tattoos, on the, the tape underneath people's eyes. John 3, 16. Now it's a famous verse. Maybe you memorized it in Sunday school or at a camp, but it's a verse that's out there in our culture. Now I wonder if the context that we provide today, when we read it in light of the verses around it, and even an Old Testament passage from thousand plus years earlier, I wonder if it might reframe the way we think about that verse. It's familiar, but sometimes the context can reshape the way we think about something. Now, our first reading, though, is from the book of Numbers. It's the Old Testament, one of the first five books of the Bible called the Torah. In the book of Numbers, the people of Israel, they've been saved from Egypt. They're no longer slaves. They've been rescued. And on the horizon is the promised land, 
Canaan, the land flowing with milk and honey. So there's an excitement of what God promised to our ancestors. It's coming. We're headed there. And we're not there anymore, but we're also not there yet. And they're stuck. They're wandering the wilderness. And they've been wandering for a very, very long time. And quite frankly, they're sick of it. And they're complaining. Why did you bring us out here just to die, Moses? Might be better if we were still slaves in Egypt. So that's the context for Numbers 21. Beginning in verse 4, it says, They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses. And they said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt just to die in the wilderness? There is no bread. There is no water. We despise, detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and they will live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake, they looked at the bronze snake, they lived. Here ends our Old Testament reading. Now our gospel reading actually begins a couple of verses before John 3:16. So beginning in verse 14. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have everlasting life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Here ends our gospel reading. Will you join me in prayer? Holy Spirit, open our hearts to receive your word. Reveal to us the good news. Enable us to trust in you. Amen. John 3, 14 begins, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Now why in the world would Jesus use this image? And why would John quote Jesus and write about it to his audience in the first century? to quote an ancient story from the Bronze Age, from 1,500 years before Jesus. Well, to understand why, we need to back up a little bit in chapter 3, where a Pharisee named Nicodemus comes to Jesus. So John 3 begins, Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. Now, John is packing a lot into that first verse. His original hearers would have known the conflict that the Pharisees had with Jesus. The Pharisees, the word means set apart or holy. They were different. They were intentionally different, intentionally following the law, trying to do their best to make the conditions right for the Messiah to come. 
obeying, following, teaching the rules. And so Nicodemus is a Pharisee. He's also a member of the Jewish ruling council. So he has some privilege, some power, some clout, some standing. And he comes to Jesus. But verse 2 says, he comes to Jesus at night. Why? Why would this Pharisee, a man with some standing, come to Jesus at night? What's he hiding? What's he afraid of? Who does he not want to know that he went and saw Jesus? It's interesting. And he says to Jesus, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs that you are doing if God were not with him. So Nicodemus, this Pharisee, this member of the Jewish ruling council, is impressed with Jesus' signs. Jesus turns water into wine at a wedding. He heals a blind man, a lame man a man with leprosy. He's doing these things that are supernatural. They're out of the ordinary, extraordinary. And people are noticing, people are talking. There's there's word around town. Did you see what Jesus did? Did He did it again. Did you hear? And so word is spreading. And no normal person could do this. So God must be with this Jesus, Nicodemus thinks. And Jesus says, hey, it's it's not about the miracles. In order to be part of the kingdom of God, you need to be born again. Have you heard this phrase? Has this phrase been used against you or, or to you? You need to be born again. Well, here's where that phrase comes from. John 3, Jesus talking to a Pharisee named Nicodemus. You need to be born again. And Nicodemus is an educated man. He's, what are you talking about, Jesus? I can't be born again. I can't go back into my mother's womb and be born a second time. And Jesus says, no, I'm talking about being born of the Spirit. The wind blows, it comes and it goes, and you can't see where it's coming from, and you can't see the wind, but, but the Spirit moves. And Nicodemus doesn't get it, and, and the Gospels often, often show us that people don't get it. And that Jesus, really? Do you still not understand, he says? How can this be? And Jesus uses this example from Numbers. The Son of Man must be lifted up, just as Moses lifted up a snake. Now, what is that about? That doesn't mean anything to us. We don't know that story, maybe. But Nicodemus did. He certainly would have. He's a teacher of the law. He probably had the book of Numbers memorized. So he knows what Jesus is talking about. So there's this time. Israelites are in the desert, and there's lots of snakes, and they're getting bit. And they tell Moses, Moses, we messed up. We know that we let God down. We we complained against you. We spoke against you and against God, and now we're getting punished. And These snakes are killing us. Moses, please talk to God. Pray to God that these snakes take the snakes away. We're sorry. You see, they they were Bronze Age people. Their understanding of the world was that if, if something bad happened, well, God must be angry. And God is causing this bad thing. And so they pray. They tell Moses, pray that God would take the snakes away. I wonder how often do we have that same understanding of the world? Something bad happens, a hurricane, a flood, a disease, a diagnosis. And we start flipping through our mind. What did I do to deserve this? What, how can I make God happy? What did I do? We have this Bronze Age understanding of the world still sometimes religious guilt and shame, and we pray, God, please take the snakes away. My family has a friend who died this past week, a young mom and wife. When she got a diagnosis several years ago, lots of us prayed that God would take the snakes away. 
but the snakes are still there in the story. The snakes don't get taken away. Instead, God says to Moses, put up this snake on a pole. And if people look at it, they're going to be saved. Now that doesn't make sense to us today, maybe. Our empirical minds want to figure out, well, how would that in any way stop the snake's venom? But it made sense to them. And I wonder what we can learn from it. Because God doesn't always take the snakes away. Have you prayed that God would do something? Sometimes our prayers get answered. Sometimes it all works out in the way we want it to. And plenty of other times, the pandemic is still here. Life is still hard. The darkness is still real. And sometimes I'm critical about Bronze Age thinking, whether it was 1,500 years before Jesus or people who think that way now, that God is angry and so now I have cancer. I don't think that that's how God works. I don't think God gives people cancer. But I also have to acknowledge that I don't have a good argument for why there is so much pain and suffering in the world if God is good. We wrestle with that, and I don't have a great answer. I've learned to live with the tension more than I was able to in my 20s. But the darkness is real, and life is hard. But in the midst of the darkness, we also can point to the light. We have glimmers of light, even in a pandemic. We have things that we can point to and say, that's good. I'm glad for this or for that. I'm glad for you. I'm glad that we're in this together, whatever this is. What is it about darkness? And light. Why does Nicodemus visit Jesus under the cover of night? He's hiding something. Verna A. Holyhead, in her book Sowing the Seed, she says in John's Gospel, raising or lifting up always has the double sense of crucifixion and resurrection. Death and exaltation, for the two movements are inseparable. So when Jesus says the Son of Man must be lifted up, he's predicting his death on the one hand, but also his resurrection, darkness and light by the Son of Man being lifted up, just as that snake in the desert God provided a way out. The snakes weren't removed. Apparently, they were still biting people. But God provided light in the darkness. And Jesus tells Nicodemus, who comes to him under the cover of darkness, the Son of Man will be lifted up. Verna Holyhead continues, Often we prefer the false safety of darkness to the light that Christ exposes. Because that light exposes our selfishness, our racism, our sexism, and our violence. She continues, Lent is designed to drag us out of the darkness and into the Easter light of Christ. Lent is designed to drag us out of the darkness and into the Easter light of Christ. As we read these stories, as we rehear a verse that is probably familiar, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but will have everlasting life. For John, that word believes is always an action. 
It's ongoing. It's not this one time in a basement or at a church camp, and now I'm good. Now I have eternal life. Jesus is talking about this ongoing commitment. Last week, he said, take up your cross daily. Continue to follow me. It's this ongoing work, pursuing the light, making active choices to work for God's reign and rule in the world. So a question to ponder. In this season of Lent, where we are affirming over and over that God is at work, a question, what does the light of God's truth reveal about our lives during this season of Lent? And to reframe that in Verna Holyhead's statement, where is our selfishness, our racism, our sexism, or our violence being exposed? And we can think of that personally, where is mine? What what is the light exposing from my life? That's part of Lent. Personal piety, personal reflection. Where is God working in my life? But there's also a communal sense in our society, in our church, in our institutions, in our systems. Where is sexism and racism and violence and selfishness and injustice? Where is the light exposing the darkness? Because God is still at work. Amen. Men of faith, rise up and sing of the great and glorious King. Who are strong when you feel weak in your broken Shout to the north and the south, sing to the east and the west, Jesus, the Savior to all, Lord of heaven and earth. Rise up, women of the truth, stand and sing to broken hearts, who can know the healing power of our awesome King. As we gather in a time of prayer today, we would like to highlight our college-age friends. Over this past month, the Christian Education Board has written personal notes to 25 of our college friends. We've also sent them gift cards and we thank all of those who are able to financially help us in that. We've already started to receive thank you notes and how appreciated the gifts and the reminders of the church family are to these young people. So I would like to say 
the first name of the 25 students. They are CC, Jack, Mitchell, Kate, Grace, Carly, Aaron, Emmy, Cody, John, William, Abby, Kendall, Jack, Rachel, Noah, Daniel, Owen, Sloan, Anthony, Taylor, Jacob, Claire, Emily, Zach. As we hear these names, we are reminded of the rich friendships and the families that are a part of our church congregation. From coast to coast, there are students. There are students working part-time and school part-time. There are those who are still at home and doing online schooling. It's been a very unique year with a lot of ups and downs and no one knows that more clearly than our college friends. And so let us say a prayer thinking of them. Let us pray together. Creator God, we praise you for the beauty of this earth, for the vastness of your kingdom, and for the blessings of our church family. Even now, as we read the 25 names of these young people, we are inspired by your goodness, by the creativity and the gifts and the passion of these young people. Bless them and protect them, O Lord, in their ventures. We pray for wisdom for them in their studies and their decision making. We pray for good health and strength in these trying times. And we pray for joy and inspiration in their friendships and their relationships. And even through the ups and downs of this year, we pray that there is much that was learned and many skills that were attained and that your love is growing in their hearts. We ask your care for the families who support and nurture these young people. We pray for encouragement for moms and dads and grandparents and for siblings too. Bless our college friends, O oh Lord. And for our greater congregation, O oh Lord, we lift before you those who are in need. For those who are sick or ill or alone, we ask your mercy and healing. We pray for those who have grown in new ways in this year, for new job opportunities, new marriages, new birthdays, new births. We ask your loving care and that joy may abound. Be with us, O oh Lord, as we go into this week, into your kingdom and into your light. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And as we continue to write the words of Psalm 121 on our hearts, I invite us all to hear the reading by Al and Molly and a few pictures from some youth trips in the past. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. In his 
One of the ways that we respond to God's word is through offering, offering ourselves as living sacrifices and offering some of our stuff for the ministry and work that God is doing in the world. If you'd like to support the ministry of this church, there's a link below this video in the description. And as we do that, I invite you to pray. Merciful God, we thank you for your wonderful works in this world. Accept our offerings and the dedication of our lives to you. Help us to be for the world an emblem of your steadfast love. Amen. Friends, as we go, we go in God's peace, and we invite you to pass the peace of Christ to those around you. Reach out to your friends and your neighbors, to the church family. Pass God's peace. And now, as we begin a new year, as we move forward in this season of Lent, in the midst of darkness, but seeing the glimpses of light, seeing Christ lifted up. Friends, go in God's grace and God's peace. May you experience the love of Christ today and this week. Amen. Lord, who throughout these forty days for us did fast and pray, teach us with you to mourn our sins and close by you to stay.